Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Rough Writer, where every week we talk writing, self-publishing, and making it as an author. We're continuing our author series, name pending. I still don't have a name for it, but when I do, I'll start saying that in these intros. But uh, today, we've got Jackson Banks with us, who actually, that is a pen name. So that's going to be pretty interesting to talk about the reasoning behind that, because there's so many reasons to write under a pseudonym. So yeah, Jackson, how are you doing today? Doing well. How about yourself? Not too bad. So um, I guess let's get started with just talking about who you are. Um, give us your background. Uh, you know, how do you, how you started writing, like where all this started for you? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I started writing uh, in college, actually. I was uh, taking a creative writing class to get my general college prerequisites and fell in love with it and been doing it ever since. And then probably about 10 years ago, I started uh, writing longer things uh, other than short stories and turning them into novel length manuscripts and decided to go the self-publishing route and I've been doing that ever since. Cool. Um, so everyone that I've talked to so far had sort of a different reason for going into self-publishing. Um, you know, some people were saying they wanted just kind of like full artistic freedom to write whatever they wanted and not have to worry about a publisher's approval. Other people were just kind of demoralized by querying for so long and not really having any luck with it. So like, where do you fall in that? Like, what was your kind of rationale for pursuing the indie route for everything? I think part of it is I, I'm an impatient person by nature. So I did not, I knew I was not going to like spending a year or more, you know, sending out a hundred different query letters and waiting to get a response if you ever get a response. And then as the years have gone by, you know, I've kept my eye on the publishing industry and I've I've seen it's kind of my understanding is it's kind of a mess right now. My last novel, Alligator River, I did query probably like a good like five dozen agents and got some good response. But, um, you know, I, I just it never took off. Um, you know, so part of the reason I do it is one, I'm impatient and just and just don't want to wait for somebody to respond mm -hmm. and wait three years for a book to come out if I've already finished the manuscript. And and the other thing is too, also part of that control of it. You, you know, I, I want to be able to de determine where it's going to be distributed, how it's going to be marketing. Most traditionally published authors now have to do a lot of their own marketing anyway. So if you're going to be doing 90% of the work, why pay, you know, two middlemen on your royalty split? Um, so that, that that's one of the reasons I do it. Absolutely. And I, I can relate to that with the impatience, because when you spent all this time writing a book, because you wanted to get it out of your head and you want to try to, you know, it's a short uh, story that you want to share with people. Um, it's not, it, your goal isn't to just like let it sit there for several years until it becomes available and hopefully people see it. Um, so I get wanting to kind of go that route just so that way, you know what, I can get my story out to the world and then hopefully people are going to see it and enjoy it. So I get that. And then especially the uh, artistic freedom, you know, I, I tend to write things that maybe are not always well received um, in terms of like political message and stuff like that. So it was just easier for me to be like, you know what, I don't need anyone's approval. I'm just going to put it out there. So so I understand that that kind of element there in terms of going into self-publishing in the first place. So um, so you got two books, no, three books. Uh, I'm wrong. It's three books out. Two of them are are related. One of them is kind of something separate. So you write in like crime, kind of like legal thriller genre, which is going to be cool for me um, because I don't really, it's not a genre that I've read too much of. Like I've read, I don't know, like I've read like James Patterson. I read like one book because um, my old boss like worshipped him. So she was trying to get me to read this book. So I read one and it, it, I liked it. But overall, it's one that I'm not super familiar with. But you are actually a trial lawyer. So right. I feel like that, that definitely, you know, you're writing in a genre that you are kind of an expert in. Like you can probably write really realistically with mm -hmm. that. So, you know, tell me a little bit about your books. The first one is called Alligator River, a thriller that came out in 2022. And mm -hmm. then um, you've got another one that's going to be coming out. It's, I saw it's available for pre-order now. So that's Conflict of Interest, a legal thriller. So tell me a little bit about those and just kind of how your own education and career that you have in law has sort of 
influenced your decision to write in that genre and just how how has it made the writing process for you like is it a little bit easier than it would be for someone like me who doesn't know anything <laughs> and only knows legally blonde and judge judy <laughs> yeah so I, I guess that goes back to the old old cliche maxim of write what you know right like i, I, I um you know, I am a trial lawyer, which which is a busy job, has a lot of hours to it. So I try to minimize the amount of research I have to do and rather spend my time writing. So I'm like, this just this is right in a category that we already know kind of the procedure behind it and what's what's going on. So Alligator River is more of a crime thriller. It's it's got some legal in it, but it's mainly um what it's about is a serial killer is uh, stalking individuals in northeastern North Carolina on the Outer Banks, and a a man is framed for one of the murders, and the public defender actually figures it out and works with uh, some law enforcement to try to catch catch the killer. And then Conflict of Interest is a true legal thriller. It, it centers around a civil case that's proceeding through trial. And the lawyer gets involved in some hot water, and it, it's really an ethical dilemma for him that he has to resolve as it goes through. Um, so, so that's kind of where it comes from. You know, the the, the legal thriller coming out, conflict of interest, is is tr a true courtroom drama, and that my background serves well because a lot of what you see in it, as far as jury selection, the there's a lot of scenes in the trial itself where witnesses are being cross examined. Um, it's very very close to what we would do in real life so cool so for someone who maybe isn't familiar so much with just you know trials and any sort of legal issues like for your second novel conflict of interest which i know you said is a little bit more law heavy than the first one like when you're writing it do you have to kind of think about what people might be able to like understand like like how technical can you get with like legal issues when you start using like latin phrases and uh like legalese for things like is it kind of um is it like just lay person friendly or do you not uh do you do you kind of stick to writing on a level that maybe might be lost on some people but if you're intelligent you can you can catch on <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very lay person friendly. Like if if you can follow an episode of Law and Order, or if you can follow Legally Blonde, you'll do fine with the book. Um, it's it's not you're not going to see any Latin in it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's very storytelling. I I like it because unlike an actual courtroom, I I can control what happens. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and you know you're not going to see a lot of legal argument in it. It's more like the the drama that people like when they do watch. Uh, t you know, lawyer shows on TV or or lawyer movies is is more the drama, the cross examination, and the argument. It's not the technical aspects that us trial lawyers are actually concerned about with the judge. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it's it's very story oriented. You're not going to see a lot of legal jargon in it. Um, you know, frankly, that's that's not what we do as trial lawyers anyway. We're persuading twelve people in a box, twelve regular people in a box. So we're we're trying to talk to them like regular people anyway, and not not what you may see on TV and making legal arguments like you would to the Supreme mm -hmm. Court or something like that. So Yeah, like uh, this is for my own curiosity just because I'm not, I, I was called for jury duty once and wasn't choose, <laughs> chosen as a um, as a juror. But is it really as theatrical in terms of like these giant sweeping like monologues that the, the lawyers do? Or is it kind of like, in real life is maybe a little bit less dramatic than it's, um, it's extremely boring is what it is, it, is it's it? extremely boring there's a lot of waiting <laughs> around there's a lot of testimony that is not dramatic um i you know i've been doing it 16 years and i've tried over 40 cases and i've never seen a tom cruise moment in court where he's yeah. you know somebody's yelling i want the truth or anything like that it's it's uh very rarely do you have any kind of drama there are some there's some levity to it every now and then a witness will get up there that does something that makes everybody in the courtroom laugh. Um, you know, there are some witnesses that are uh, academic because uh, they're experts and you'll glance over and one or two, the jury may be asleep. So it is nothing like um, what you would expect is that is, you know, it's actually pretty boring for the most part. Um, that's why I like writing in the genre because I can actually make it interesting um, and and add that drama everybody likes, make it more fast paced, and cut out the boring parts. So, cool. 
And they take place in North Carolina and you're based out of North Carolina, right? So you kind of tend to write in, just like you were saying, write what you know. um, And that's why you stuck to kind of like crime, legal. So is it the same with like kind of setting? You you know, you're, are are you writing like real places and and places that you've been to? Yeah. So in in both books, the setting is, are real places, Um, you know, in Alligator River, there's a scene in a coffee shop that, I'm not sure if it's still open, but it was a real coffee shop in Manteo, North Carolina. Um, you know, the courthouse uh, that's described in Conflict of Interest is our courthouse here in Wake County, North Carolina, where where Raleigh is, where I live. Um, you know, I, I always like that. Like, I like books. I like to read books where it's set in a location that's real um, and you can read it and um, the places are real. Um, you know, the, Stephen Hunter wrote a book one time called Hot Springs. I used to spend the summers in Hot Springs, Arkansas, growing up. It, it I mean, I could picture everything crystal clear because it, it was real. Like that, that's what I prefer is a fictional world set in a real place. Mm-hmm. I've been so now that I've moved to Vegas, this is like the city I feel like would be a great place to set something in. So I keep, I, I'm trying to think of an idea for something that I still haven't really come up with anything. Like I'm in plastic surgery. Well, I'm not in plastic surgery anymore. I got out of that. Now I'm in just like aesthetics, but I'm like, I, I feel like a, like a mystery kind of thriller about someone getting killed in surgery would be an interesting one, especially set in Vegas. So I like people who write in the the area that they know and, and are writing real world places that anyone maybe who's from there or has been to there can read this and be like, oh, that's like, yeah, like that, that's, that's the real place. So I had mentioned this in, a, in another interview, but I knew someone who, so I'm from Long Island originally. And um, it was someone who wrote, a lot uh he wrote stories that took place on long island and it was out east where i'm from which is not an area that a lot of people end up going to unless you're just you know a local person so you know it's not the hamptons it's just like you know average downstate new york town and um it was cool to be able to say oh i i know patchogue i'm from patchogue no one talks about patchogue like or like this is that town or or this bar or this restaurant and i just always think that's really cool when people do that so i like that you're setting it in a in a real world place that you're familiar with so the first one at least i i I don't know about the second book but alligator river is um is like a serial killer kind of story right. right okay with true crime being so big right now i feel like that is just like a great subject matter to go into um, that uh, people are like obsessed with that now. So um, that's how I got the idea for it. I was actually on a business trip out to the Outer Banks and I was listening to season one of Counterclock with Dila D'Ambra. Um, and it, it, that season takes place with an unsolved murder in the Outer Banks where I was headed. And um, I was driving through the Alligator River National Wildlife Refuge, and I was just thinking, this would be a great place to hide a body. And, and the next thing I knew, by the time I got back to Raleigh, the, the entire novel had been plotted out in my head. And, and so true crime actually inspired that novel um, and that season of, season of it. In fact, if you've read the novel and you've watched, uh, you've listened to the podcast, there's a scene in the novel that's kind of based on on what's covered in season one of Counterclock. Cool. So you just mentioned plotting it out in your head. So I'm going to ask, because I've been asking people this, when it comes to your writing process and, and writing a novel, how, like, how is that for you? Like, I'm like a neurotic person that needs to plan literally everything. Like, I will occasionally let myself kind of go off the rails and just see where it takes me. But for the most part, I need to like, that's just how I am, that I need to have a lot of structure to it. So um, for you, you know, you, so I don't know how long it took you to write Alligator River, but Conflict of Interest isn't coming out that long after, at least like relatively that long after. It'll be about two years after, or maybe a little under two years after your first book came out, which to me, as someone who writes, like it takes me forever to write anything. I'm always impressed by that. So um, how does it go for you? Like, are are you a little bit of a slow writer? Are you kind of quick? And then are you a planner? Are you like a, you know, we'll just see where it goes kind of person? Yeah, so I'm I'm what I call a planter. Um, I'm kind of a hybrid in between. So when I get an idea, I'll do like a rough sketch of where I want the idea to go. Uh, so instead of a detailed outline, it may be like the major Roman numerals of you know each part or each each chapter. And then as far as the details and where the story goes, I kind of just start writing and see where it takes me. And oftentimes the characters end up 
going their own direction. So that original outline, by the time I get halfway through it, it's it's usually garbage and I'm not looking mm -hmm. for it anymore because the story is going to go in a different direction. Um, so it's kind of a little bit of both. As far as the writing process itself, it doesn't take me that long to actually write the novel. Um, I tend to set aside about an hour each night um, after after my son goes to bed and I try to knock out like a thousand words. So if you do that every day or almost every day, you can get a manuscript a manuscript done um, in about three, three months, three to four months. Um, what usually takes me the longest is the editing. Um, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. So when I go through it, I want to, you know, I'm looking for the, the, gram the grammatical aspects of it also fixing plot holes and, and tweaking things. That's what usually takes me the longest. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And then I'm going to ask you this, because I'm, I'm just going to ask, I'm asking everyone this. Where did you get your cover? Because that is a thing that comes up a lot. And pe some people have trouble even just getting a, like a halfway decent one. And your, yours look pretty good. So how did you go about acquiring a cover that fit your book? Yeah, sh sure. So I, I, I'm a writer, like I'm not a, a graphic designer and a cover, you know, everybody says don't judge your book by your cover, but that's just not the reality of what works. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, every time I'm in Barnes and Noble or a local bookstore, like I pick up books based on what the cover looks like. So that's extremely important, um, you know, to grab somebody's attention. So I use, I use readsy.com is like an online freelance marketplace for writers and, and individuals in this industry. So I found both my cover designers through Readsy and both my, you know, I, you're never going to catch all your mistakes either. So I also mm -hmm. uh, had both novels uh, edited uh, for proofreading and developmentally through professionals from Readsy as well. So for anyone who might end up checking out Readsy as an option after hearing this, like, what? What could they expect in terms of like a budget that they would have to set for themselves? I don't I don't really know. Like I was lucky when it came to editing that I had two friends that both work in editing professionally. So I just, you know, called in some favors. But uh, for someone who doesn't have that luxury and will end up having to pay for it, like like what did it look like for you? Like if you don't mind me asking. Sure. I, I think it depends on on who you want to design the cover or who you want to edit it to. I, I mean, Reedsy has a lot of different professionals. So the, the individual that designed Alligator River, he's done some work for the major houses, um, designed some of Karen Slaughter's covers. So he was a bit expensive. I think it was about a thousand dollars somewhere in there for the cover. Um, the one that designed uh, conflict of interest, I wanted a little bit lower budget on that one. Um, and I think that was around 500 and he's done some work with, with major authors too. It just depends on the experience of the, of the freelancer you're working with kind of what their background is and, and what you're looking for as well. Okay, cool. And then, um, so you've got a third book that is unrelated. It looks like to, to the first two that is called, I put pants on for this stories yes. and defense of stay home. So tell me about that one. Cause I thought the name was really funny. And I saw it was, you know, like a humor book uh, with a bunch of short stories about kind of why staying home is sometimes the best idea. So um, tell me a little bit about that one. Like what got you to write kind of outside of the genre that you were you're writing in in terms of fiction before? So it's actually flipped. Like that was actually the first book that was. published. Oh, yeah, I should. have. Uh, yeah, I even wrote 2019 on my notes that I have in front yeah. of me and I didn't. And I totally glossed over it. OK, yeah. What made you decide to write that first? Like what 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 was the idea behind that? That's what I had been writing for a long time. Like the first short story I ever wrote, um, you know, back in college was kind of a humor type of short story. Um, so that's what I had been writing. Uh, that's what I like to write. I read a lot of uh, Bill Bryson. I, uh, David Sedaris is one of my favorite authors. Um, you know, so it, it it was just, that's just something I like to do. I'm a naturally sarcastic kind of joke teller. Um, so that's where that book came across. The, the reason I switched to thrillers um, is, is one, humor does not sell. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to sell it unless you're a stand-up comic or somebody really well-known. Um, and then two, I just found myself, you know, when COVID hit, um, you know, it, it, things weren't as funny as they used to be in life. Mm -hmm. uh, the world took a dark turn. So I was like, well, let's, let's go into the thriller genre. So it's 
um that tends to be all i read anyway is a lot of thrillers um so we i went I pivoted towards that direction. So how long did it, um, I think you, how long did it, like, like the writing process for writing something that is humorous and, and that's all short stories, I think, right? Um, that's like right. kind of an anthology of them. So um, how long did it take you, was that a lot quicker than writing a novel or was writing like one novel, like with just one story a little quicker than writing a series of short stories for you? One novel was quicker for me because the whole story was was kind of already in my head and it was just getting it down mm -hmm. on the paper, you know, so so the novels took much less time. Um, I, I put pants on for this that probably took for, from the first story that was written to the last story that was written that probably took a good five years to finish, mainly because those stories are based on actual things that happened to me while traveling and being mm -hmm. out and about so it was kind of like. A story wouldn't get written until I went to, let's say, Vancouver and Air Can, you know, an airline gave me like the worst flight experience of my life, which is in the book. Or, mm -hmm. you know, it, it didn't get written until my wife and I celebrated an anniversary and I went for a couple's massage and it, it turned into a disaster, which is in the book. So um, that one took the longest just because they're based on things that happened to me in real life. Um, so you kind of had to wait around for those things to happen. Mm hmm. So what did you use to self-publish these? Like, did you do all of this through KDP? Did you do like the eBooks through maybe KDP and then use something else for the actual print ones? Um, I've met, like, uh, I'm only really too, I, I'm pretty familiar with KDP and then I use Ingram Spark for printing. So those are the two that I know the, the best. I had a couple of people who use Lulu and then some people who use Draft for Digital, both of which I'm not super familiar with. I had made a video like, a long long time ago when I first started all of this where I was kind of like talking out of my ass and saying like oh this is some stuff about these but I really didn't know a whole lot so um what do you use um because I'm just curious to see because it seems like people use, there's a whole bunch of different ones that you could go with yeah there are a lot of different ones my the first book I did use just exclusively through KDP um and Amazon and that was that was okay um, you know, Amazon's system to me was a little complicated to get everything set up, especially the paperback is there's a lot of formatting that goes into it. And I'm just not good at that. Um, you, you know, but, but more importantly for the, the, the last two books, I didn't want everything to be exclusively through Amazon anymore because they changed their policies so much. You're kind of beholden to what Amazon wants. Like it's, it's putting all your eggs in one basket. So what I use for Alligator River and I'm using for Conflict of Interest is draft to digital. And what they do is you upload the book. It's very similar to KDP, how it works. You upload your manuscript. They do all the formatting for you. It's very simple to get it into a finished product. And then they distribute it wide. So you can list it on Amazon. You can list it on Barnes & Noble, iBooks um, with Apple, Kobo, Smashwords, and a, and a bunch of dozen other retailers. And everything's in one big hub. So it's very easy to change the price. You know, when you change the price on one, it changes it to all. Um, so I have found that to be much better. And as far, you know, sales wise, um, draft to digital has worked better too, because you're you're in a wider market. And it, I've seen an uptick in uh, from when I was just exclusively with Amazon and when I've, I've gone wide. So how does the like royalty system compare with it, doing it on Amazon like do they treat you a little bit better or do you is, is there a little bit of a trade-off like for the ease of using it maybe there's a little bit less royalties but it's worth it for being able to do everything that you just mentioned it's actually about the same like I think oh, okay. you know I think you still get um I haven't looked at the number the breakdown in, in a little while but I, I think it's still somewhere around 70 percent of the ebook sale at least um okay. so it's, it's about the same as what you're getting on Amazon so okay cool I wish I think about this all the time I I when I first started and I'm still continuing to do this just because I'm lazy and I've never bothered to consolidate everything but I um you know, for my ebook versions of everything, I was like self publishing those on every platform individually. So it would be like KDP for Amazon, and then Google Play for, for Google, and then iTunes for Apple Books, and then Barnes Noble has theirs. And then, so I have all these accounts, 
that I have to go into individually every time. And especially if I have to make any sort of edit to the file, like say, I, I took these out now because I realized it was a problem too often to include the social media links at the end, because I tend to change my social media handles sometimes like with <laughs> rebranding things. And then you have to go back and you have to upload new files for everything. And that means that I'm, I've got like nine different, uh, like, not full novel, two full novels and a whole bunch of short stories that go along with one of them. So I'm up, I'm updating like nine files for each account every single time when I have to make like a change to just one word. And it's, um, it's, it's a pain to do that. So the idea of having it all consolidated in one place is very appealing to me. <laughs> um, yeah. So the thing with Ingram Spark that I always whine about is that they charge you revision fees for basically everything. Like no matter what kind of change you make, you end up having to pay something. And while I like the print quality of it, which is why I've stuck with it, even though I complain all the time, but I'm a New Yorker, so I just naturally complain. And I'm Italian, so it's like double complaining all the time. But <laughs> I, um, so like, does your print, like your distributor, like do they do that kind of thing? Or, or is it like KDP where either it's free or um or is it just kind of like affordable when you actually have to do revision fees yeah well for for your ebooks you can change it as much as you want whenever you want um on draft to digital and for your print books i think you get one free change every 90 days and okay. then the fee if you know let's say you make a change and within that 90 days you realize oh there's another typo i got to fix or something else i want to change there is a fee for that. I, I don't know what that fee is. Uh, um, I, I haven't tried to change it within that 90 days. Um, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, it's not like every time you make a change to your print book, you're going to be hit with a fee. Yeah. Did you shop around when you were trying to find a distributor or was this like this one of the first ones you found and it looked good to you? Like I tried out a few, but not too many. And I feel like I maybe should have looked at a few more before I started. Yeah. I looked at a few others. Ingram was one of the ones I looked at, but ultimately I settled on draft to digital just because it seemed much easier than the other platforms I looked at. Um, and it, it had good reviews. I, I, I want to say I first learned about it in writer's digest. It was one of their, like, you know, they do that top 100 websites mm -hmm. for writers issue every year. I want to say I learned about it through there and it seemed to have good reviews. And so far I've been, I've been happy with it. Uh, it's very easy to use. Uh, very easy to make changes. Um, I've had a few issues where I've had to contact customer service just because I couldn't figure something out formatting wise. Mm -hmm. um, and they responded, you know, within like a day or two. Um, it's very quick. So I, I've been very happy with them. I'll tell you, Ingram Spark is really picky with formatting and it's not easy uh, like to do that if you're not really very familiar <laughs> with yeah like formatting and, and and all of that and just design in general like they it you're when you upload those files like you'll get rejected multiple times if it's not perfect so um that, it sounds what, like that was happening to me a little lot bit with, better with that that was happening to me a lot with kdp when i was doing it through kdp especially with the cover like i i don't know what a trim size is and i can't figure out how to get it to the right size that, that that's why i have a cover artist you know like yeah um, it, you know, with draft to digital, like they have a template you can send to your cover artist or, or if you're doing it yourself that you can use that, that has all that on it. And then as far as the manuscript, the interior formatting, it's literally just, you upload the, the PDF or word doc, whatever you're going to going to use. And it has like a system that formats that all for you. Like you, very, very user-friendly error proof, um, which, which I love because I, I don't, I don't want to sit there and try to figure out like how to do all the formatting. Like I, I just want to write the story and get it out there. I don't want to sit there and get in the details on how the book is actually assembled and, and they're great at that. So that sounds like a really good option then for yeah. like, if there's anyone listening to this or watching this, that maybe isn't fully satisfied <laughs> with their print on demand company, then um, I think draft for digital sounds like a good option for people. So, um, so yeah, well, Thanks so much, Jackson. Oh, wait, wait, wait. We never got to this. Uh, do, we didn't talk about the pen name, did we? Or am I just no, like really yet. tired? Okay, let's do that. And then and then we'll wrap it up. <laughs> um, so you're writing under the name Jackson Banks. That is not your legal name. Um, so what drove you to do that? Like, I have a couple of reasons in my head that I'm thinking it might be, but I, I want to hear it 
from you? Like what, what made you decide to write under a pen name? Well, one of it is just privacy and, and Google. So, so writing is not my full-time job, uh, at least not yet. Maybe knock on wood, it will be someday. But, you know, since I am a trial lawyer, like, you know, some of the stuff I write, you know, is not necessarily something I want a client reading. You know, the conflict mm -hmm. of interest in particular has some, um, it's a bit of a, it's a legal thriller, but there's also a bit of romance in it. And there's some spiciness in it that I don't necessarily want my clients to read. So it, it's one of its an anonymity and keeping my, prof my professional day job world separate from my art. And then the other reason is just like, I, I always have delusions of grandeur sometime. Like if I ever did hit it really big and become like a Colleen Hoover or Stephen King, like it's just, it would just be better when I, when I put down a credit card somewhere that they don't know that it's me if they're fans. Mm -hmm. so that, that's kind of what it is. I, I prefer just to be behind the scenes. And the easiest way to do that was just to put up a wall between my actual identity and, and the writer. Mm -hmm. And that makes total sense, especially since you have like a real profession. It's like a real career. <laughs> that sounds insulting to people. I don't mean it that way. But like, you, I, I feel like you understand. Like, that's like an actual profession, like a calling. So it, wanting to keep your writing separate, especially if you're writing things that you don't know if it'll land well with a client or um, if it'll kind of complicate things or make it weird. I totally get that. Like, when I was still living in D.C. and I was working in plastic surgery there, um, we had a lot of senators and like federal judges and stuff who were our patients. And it was very cool to meet these people. But um, I thought about even putting stuff up under a pen name because I was writing things that were almost directly criticizing these same people, like just like with a kind of fictionalized name. But I'm like, yeah, I'm meeting someone today at work. For a procedure who I just last night was writing a scene where I was basically calling them a moron and saying that they, you know, should be arrested. So it's, uh, you know, I was kept thinking like, if anyone ever finds this, like, this be a problem. Um, I don't work there anymore, so it's not really an issue now. I just deal with like strippers and porn stars at work, but um, so uh, no real issues there. Most of, the, but, most of them are using pseudonyms anyway. You yeah, know, I was so. going to say, they all have <laughs> stage names, so it doesn't yeah. even, it doesn't even matter, but, but yeah, I, I totally get that. So, you know, I made a video once about reasons to write under a pen name. That is definitely one of them. So um, anyone out there who's watching, uh, if you've ever considered writing under a pen name, there are, there are good reasons to do so. And I think that Jackson is, um, like a good example of a very practical reason to write under one. So, um, so yeah, thank you so much, Jackson, for being here. I'm going to put links to his books in the description. So you can check out Alligator River, a thriller. And then there's also his humorous one. I put pants on for this stories in defense of staying home. And then this, uh, the second book uh conflict of interest a legal thriller the second one of his legal and crime thriller books is going to be coming out in september of this year so it is available for pre-order so i would strongly suggest that you check out alligator river and um i think you will like it if you're into true crime that would be right up your alley and then um you know after that go ahead and pre-order his second book because it's just going to continue to feed into your love of true crime so um even if it's not necessarily true it's still crime. So yeah, thank you so much, Jackson, for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So uh, we'll talk soon. And everyone, if, um, you know, if you're interested, if you're an indie author and you're interested in appearing on my channel, uh, go ahead and send me an email at roughwriter at protonmail.com. I'm very slow to respond. I've gotten way more uh, requests than I expected, but I guess I should have known um, if I went online and asked a bunch of authors to talk about their books that people might be interested. So yeah, so I might be slow to respond to you, but uh, be patient with me and um, hope to see you again soon, uh, everyone, and talk to some more authors. And thank you again, Jackson, for being here.